Kia ora tato, everybody. Uh, Bruce Harrell is my name. I'm the director of the Good Fellow Unit. And um, welcome to this uh, webinar on insom insomnia. Our pre presenter tonight is Dan Ford. We well, think he's one of two psychologists in New Zealand who actually deal with insomnia. We're often advised to get a psychologist to help with insomnia, but actually there's only two of them. And we think he's the only one in Auckland at the moment. The other one's on leave. Um, so he's trained in cognitive behavior therapy, and uh, he's had experience working in the military, Olympic athletes, police, pilots, and, um, and he's worked with doctors. Uh, he enjoys educating the public. Um, he runs a clinic called the Better Sleep Clinic, which I think is based in Teatitude, Dan, is that right? Yeah, and um, he's going to talk to us about uh, some of those cases uh, that we struggle with sometimes. So Dan. Over to you, sir. Great, good evening. I'll just get the screen share going. So good evening, uh, Tina Koto Katoa. Thanks for joining tonight. So um, tonight we're gonna to cover off uh, the following, and uh, but the key aims to, uh, tonight really are, I hope that you walk away with an up-to-date understanding of the importance of identifying insomnia in, private, uh, in primary practice. Um, that you're current and have effective tools in performing assessment and diagnosis of insomnia and that you have an understanding of insomnia treatment and then what you can do in primary practice around insomnia. Um, I'll have a few case studies um, tonight and these have been selected to really to highlight, I guess, the real life complexity that you'll see in the um, inpatient presentations um, and hopefully the usefulness of the assessment instruments um, that I uh, point out and uh, and also get a sense of treatment results. Um, they're sort of pretty standard results, not always the results you see. Um, so the case studies are actual um, clients uh, that have been through the clinic. So um, I hope it's not teaching you to suck eggs, but the reason why I've gone down this route is because I guess a lot of conversations with uh, GPs, sports doctors, um, even urologists uh, show that Often there's a bit of misunderstanding about um, treatment for insomnia in which insomnia sits in terms of its importance. So, um, so yeah, let's get into that. So um, what is insomnia? So just starting with a really um, layman's definition. So out of the Derek Zoolander dictionary, I guess, um, insomnia is really about people who can't sleep real good. Um, so, uh, but in terms of population prevalence, uh, depending on how strict you use um, in terms of definition criteria. You get really big numbers in some studies, uh, but when you really look across um, different countries with a tight definition, uh, you're looking at about six to 10% of the general population experiencing chronic insomnia. Um, it's more prevalent in females, and you're also gonna see it a lot in older individuals. So um, other points of note here, um, Short-term insomnia is a diagnostic criteria for the um, American Academy of Sleep Medicine um, International Classification of Sleep Disorders 3. And it's important to note this because um, it can seem like something that'll just go away, but for about 40% of um, people with short-term insomnia, it'll develop into chronic insomnia. And then um, from there, what you'll typically see well, the studies show that you're looking at about um, after one year, 70% um, of people still have chronic insomnia and three years later, 50% will still have chronic insomnia. So it's something that you do need to pay attention to. Now, in primary care, you're gonna see a, a lot greater prevalence simply because of the kinds of populations that you're dealing with. So, why should you be paying attention to this? Why should you pay attention to insomnia? After all, isn't it just a secondary disorder that will clear up after you treat the primary presenting health issue? Uh, because that's really the way that we've treated it over the past sort of 10, 20 years. Um, but research is changing that. So um, what we do know is um, that uh, insomnia research has actually been quite equivocal about the health impacts, but more recent meta-analyses and longitudinal research is showing that um, we do have these physical health impacts from insomnia. And the, the group with the um, biggest impact, the most severe uh, males that have short objective sleep. 
So another thing to note is there's a really high economic cost um, that comes with insomnia. So we think about one third of absentee days are due to poor sleep, uh, usually in some sort of insomnia. And, uh, and also those numbers there are extrapolated from a recent Australian study and into New Zealand dollars and New Zealand GDP. It's about 1% for the total economic cost when we take medical, um, burden of care, dead weight loss, all that stuff into account. So it's quite a costly condition. If there's one thing I really want you to take away tonight is to, I uh, just want to highlight, um, and I guess it's close to my heart being a psychologist, but uh, the growing burden, and with the growing burden of mental health conditions, is the role of insomnia in mental health morbidity. So, um, and that's really important because if you look at the sort of the latest stuff that's coming out of, uh, say, the Dunedin Longitudinal Study, it's suggesting around 80% of their cohort has experienced mental illness by middle age. So, um, so you know, good mental health is less likely than uh, to have a mental illness at some point. And what we see is insomnia is often comorbid with mental health issues. And in fact, 90% of insomniacs will present or possibly have a comorbid mental health diagnosis. So the really important point here to take away is when it comes to insomnia and insomnia treatment, comorbidity is the rule, not the exception. So the research has shown that unresolved insomnia predicts relapse for mental health conditions. So I'll talk about it a bit more later, but insomnia is now considered a primary disorder. It's not going to remit without specific attention and treatment. Um, and it's going to be some sort of insomnia focused treatment. So insomnia is well established that it's a risk factor for developing depression. So where insomnia and uh, depression are comorbid, insomnia occurs first in around 70% of the depression cases. Uh, and I'd also note here um, that when you see pediatric insomnia, it's predictive of adolescent insomnia. And adolescent insomnia is going to be predictive of adult insomnia. And now what I'm also telling you is adult insomnia is going to possibly be predictive of um, mental health disorders and especially major depressive disorder. When we do see insomnia with depression, it actually increases the severity of depression, makes it a lot more difficult to treat. Uh, and also here it's going to, um, if we don't resolve the insomnia by treating it specifically, uh, it's going to predict major depression, uh, relapse into depression. So those are some pretty um, interesting numbers there and relapse over 15 months. When it comes to anxiety, it's a little bit different. Uh, about sort of 60% of anxiety disorders will, um, the anxiety disorder precedes the insomnia, but we still see around about 25% of um, anxiety cases, the insomnia develops before or at the same time as the insomnia, sorry, as the anxiety disorder. And just drilling into that importance, insomnia also increases suicide risk. And this is independent of depression severity. I forget what the exact number is here, maybe twice the risk, three times the risk, I can't quite remember. So let's get a little bit of a closer definition of what's going on when we're talking about insomnia. There's actually, um, unfortunately, there's actually three different nosologies that include insomnia. Um, you've got the International Classification of Sleep Disorders. Um, that's the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. And that's going to be the uh, most detailed generally for sleep disorders and specifically for insomnia. Um, and you've got the DSM-5 and the ICD-10. So, the uh, each has different but overlapping diagnostic criteria. The key shared features actually that insomnia is a subjective complaint still. So uh, the foundation of insomnia is dissatisfaction with the quality or quantity of sleep. There are no objective requirements such as the number of minutes to fall asleep or length of time awake at night, nothing like that, still subjective. Good news though, is that all the research that I just mentioned to you um, 
point has pointed towards big revisions for insomnia diagnosis. And so in the ICSD-3 and the DSM-5, we see a simplification and also a bringing together of insomnia as a disorder. So previously, we used to have primary insomnia and then secondary insomnia if there was some other diagnosis going on. Um, but now we just have one comorbid insomnia diagnosis. So, um, so the conceptual differentiation between the primary and secondary insomnia has been abandoned. Um, and that really recognizes that um, insomnia is a standalone disorder of its own. So it should be diagnosed um, when the insomnia warrants independent clinical attention. Um, and that's regardless of whether there are other medical, mental health or substance use disorders present. And we've also lost the insomnia subtypes. So you used to have um, different kinds of insomnia like psychophysiological insomnia or paradoxical insomnia. Those have been eliminated simply because there's a lack of evidence um, that these are distinct clinical entities. So that makes life a lot easier. This is what the uh, actual diagnostic criteria look like side by side. You can see there's some sort of sleep complaint in both uh, the DSM and the ICSD and difficulty initiating sleep, difficulty maintaining sleep, early morning awakenings, uh, and then you've got some sort of daytime dysfunction or impact on you. You also see with the ICSD um, three, there's a few criteria there for childhood insomnia. So that's folded into um, the adult criteria somewhat. Um, you also see here, uh, there needs to be some sort of adequate opportunity for sleep. So the person needs to be giving themselves the opportunity to sleep, but can't sleep. Um, and also you've got a frequency. So it's gonna, you're gonna have to have the complaint at least three nights a week, and then a duration of at least three months. And then it's chronic insomnia or insomnia disorder in the DSM-5. The, uh, the ICSD-3 also has a, uh, a diagnostic criteria called um, short-term insomnia. And so the key difference is that there's no freak between the chronic insomnia and the short-term insomnia is that there's no frequency specified and this will be less than three months and that's short-term insomnia. Um, that condition in the DSM-5 just comes under other insomnia disorder. Now, if you are thinking about um, trying to make it a bit less subjective, then usually a sleep um, specialist will be talking about 30 minutes, three, three times a week for more than three months, 30 minutes to fall asleep, um, or more than 30 minutes to fall asleep and or more than 30 minutes awake at night. Uh, those are based on um, longitudinal studies of uh, normal sleepers and the confidence intervals through which most people are falling into in terms of their sleep. All right, so introducing the um, patients and really just highlighting um, what a typical presentation looks like. Um, what you see is a lot of complexity and comorbidity. So Joe's a 50 year old mechanic. He's got sleep problems for a number of years now. He's actually um, coming off paroxetine. Um, it's just not working for him. Um, he's got trouble falling asleep, early morning awakenings, uh, reduced total sleep time. He's got eczema, so there's a, another condition present and that does impact his sleep. He's a loud snorer, um, he's got morning headaches and reflux. So a couple of things here straight away. Um, it's probably not rebound um, sleep uh, problems from coming off the paroxetine because it's, it's probably just uncovering um, what's been there already. And um, eczema, you'd be wondering, is that controlled um, at the moment? And then this loud snoring, uh, morning headaches, reflux. The presence of loud snoring should put you on alert for respiratory sleep disorders. And I'll talk a bit more about that as we move through. Second patient, um, any more 33 year old film and TV worker. So work stress is a trigger. And so what you'll see with insomnia is there's usually some sort of stress or as a trigger. And, um, but this, the studies show that intensity or duration of the stresses are not predictive of whether insomnia will develop. It's just, does the person have a vulnerability to stress? So it's relatively short term problems, um, but as you can see there, there's quite a bit going on for her. So a couple of things to note, um, melatonin's there, been um, 
prescribed. So that's not recommended by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine uh, for insomnia, uh, but still there on um, some other organizations do. I think the American Academy of Family Physicians do um, recommend, I'm not sure in New Zealand, uh, She's having some thoughts of suicide, so you pay attention to what's going on. Um, nightmares, so there's a nightmare disorder criteria. Is that impacting her? Does she have nightmare disorder? And that also increases the risk of suicide. It's also a shift worker. So shift workers are typically short sleepers um, and due to their shift work and often circadian misalignment is quite common for them. So need to be aware of that as well. So Craig is a 38 year old engineer. He's number patient number three. He's got major depressive disorder diagnosed already. He's on sertraline. He's had sleep problems for years um, and he's got trouble falling asleep, staying asleep. And look at that, he's tried quite a few different medications and they didn't work for him. He's waking with panic attacks. So for reasons, as I'll explain again, waking with panic attacks, I'd be thinking about respiratory sleep problems and obstructions um, that are waking him up with these symptoms. All right, so what are we gonna do in terms of diagnosing and ass assessing and diagnosing these people? So really important to note that with insomnia and a lot of uh, sleep disorders actually, um, the gold standard is a diagnostic interview. And so polysomnogram, polysomnograph, it's not required. Um, the diagnostic interview um, is going to be a detailed sleep history, including reviewing nighttime, daytime symptoms, habits, routines throughout the day and night. Um, you're also going to need to um, look for coexisting um, sleep wake disorders and mental health um, disorders as well, due to that comorbidity that I mentioned. Um, what I've done there is highlight in red the stuff that you're less likely to have. Um, in the primary um, setting. So you'll have to come up with some way to get at this sort of information. I'd say the additional sleep related symptoms you'd pick up with, the, um, with anything that you're going to use to pick up sleep wake disorders. I like to highlight the sleep log in the diary here. Um, it's actually a consensus recommendation for diagnosis by the um, AASM, American Academy of Sleep Medicine. Um, a good sleep log, this is, I'll put this one up um, after the talk. Um, this is what the sort of, this is very close to the consensus recommended sleep log. Um, I think already up there is kind of like a colored in sleep log. I don't like those, they're hard to tell anything. Um, but it's recommended that you get about 14 days of, of sleep log to confirm a diagnosis. Um, but seven is usually pretty good. Um, and as Bruce and I were talking about earlier, it kind of buys you a little time too to figure out what the hell's going on with people. And I filled in there. Um, you can see uh, when you give it to someone, it's pretty simple to fill in. It takes about two minutes, first thing in the morning when they wake up. Um, I filled in the first day here of the night of sleep that I wish I had last night. Um, and uh, it doesn't require any clock watching from about the time that you turn the lights out to go to sleep, all the rest, and you could probably reflect on your own night and do this yourself. You can sort of reflect on how long did it feel like it took me to fall asleep? And did I remember waking up? And how long did that feel like for the, for the, um, the awakening? So it's all just done on subjective feel. And, um, and clients actually really find this really interesting because they're obsessed with their sleep usually already. And, um, but I'd like to highlight how helpful it is in diagnosis and treatment of insomnia as we go through. So I talked before about, um, I mentioned you need to pick up other sleep wake disorders. If I just go back one slide. Um, so in some ways, because you can treat insomnia without treating comorbid mental health disorders and sometimes physical um, health disorders, uh, then you really need to focus in on the coexisting sleep wake disorders um, and know what's going on there. Because if you then pick the wrong, if you diagnose the wrong disorder, and then you'll be using a treatment that just is not going to be effective. So what you've got to be aware of for other diagnoses or sleep wake disorders, obstructive sleep apnea or OSA um, is important to differentiate. Um, so about 30% of OSA sufferers will have chronic insomnia. So OSA is where the tongue and the soft palate block the airway while you're sleeping. Um, your brain gets a signal uh, or starts to believe, well, my human is suffocating to death. And so it sends adrenaline shooting through the system to make the body breathe. Um, typically the sufferer stays asleep, but the body is awake the whole night. The net result is they wake up 
asking themselves, I slept all night last night. Why do I feel so fatigued and stuffed? All right. So, and that's because their body's been awake all night. And the net result of that is if you've got severe ulcer and it remains untreated, about seven years later, you've got quite a high risk of being dead. Um, but it can look like insomnia, right? Where people are waking up at night because the obstruction is actually waking them up. And then sometimes they're having panic symptoms. So their heart's racing because they haven't got any oxygen, that sort of stuff. So got to keep a lookout for that. The second set of disorders that you really want to be aware of is um, circadian sleep-wake disorders. Um, so what we mean here is that most people um, have a normal body clock. And so, for example, here, um, this person or this average person is going to sleep at midnight and there's a consolidated sleep period through to 8 a.m. So there's eight hours of sleep. But you can see here, this person gets consolidated sleep when they fall asleep at 8 p.m. and they sleep through to 4 a.m. So that's an advanced sleep phase disorder. They're getting normal sleep, but it's advanced. They're falling asleep earlier. But of course, then they're awake in the back half of the night and that could look like insomnia. Um, and then you've got delay, and you often see that with older folk and for various reasons. And then you've got delayed sleep phase. You typically see this with younger folk. Um, and what is happening here is they are, they all get consolidated sleep, but only if they're going to be quite late. So 2, 2 a.m. through to sort of 10 a.m. is quite common. Here we've got 4 a.m. to noon. Of course, when you have to get up for work the next day, your sleep gets truncated. And so these people are chronically um, sleep deprived, but they also look like they're having trouble falling asleep at the start of the night. So we want to keep a lookout for those as we go through. What are your options then for diagnosis in the primary care setting? So um, some quick and useful general instruments. So the Auckland Sleep Questionnaire, the short tool, um, I believe that is been um, recommended by the Goodfellow Unit. Um, that's a pretty good tool um, and it's short, 20 questions, um, and it picks up on insomnia, shift work disorders, um, snoring, which will be related to obstructive sleep apnea, daytime sleepiness, which are hypersomnolence type disorders, narcolepsy type things. You've got parasomnias um, and a few other things like depression, anxiety, oh, and you've got delayed sleep wake phase disorder in there as well. Um, another option is the um, that I'm putting forward, um, just because it's good to have two options. Um, the sleep disorder symptom checklist. So there's 25 questions there. It covers um, 13 sleep disorders, um, including all the ones that I just mentioned on the Auckland Sleep Questionnaire. Uh, the key differences here are the Auckland Sleep Questionnaire is designed by um, primary care physicians and in New Zealand. And so it's a good um, short tool that really fits the New Zealand context. On the other hand, if you tend to be a bit of a geek um, like me, then you might like the sleep disorders symptom checklist because it is a validated measure and, uh, and it's got scoring to it. So you can hand it off to someone else, they can score it up for you. And then you can have some sort of certainty around whether or not someone's got this disorder or not. So that's what you'd be using to screen for um, sleep-wake disorders. You need to supplement that though um, to get a bit more detail. And what I'd be recommending is the Insomnia Severity Index. So seven questions, so pretty quick as well. Um, that's gonna tell you really, it's gonna tell you about insomnia symptoms, but it will actually tell you about the severity of any sleep disorder that the people complaint that the person has, um, whether or not it's insomnia. Um, the, uh, I believe a score of 10 is optimal for um, insomnia. It's got an 86% sensitivity if they meet the other criteria, such as trouble falling asleep, staying asleep. Uh, sorry, if they meet the other criteria like three nights a week for more than three uh, months. The Ipworth Sleepiness Scale. There's actually a consensus recommendation by the AASM as well that it should be used in diagnosis. Um, and that is uh, the Ipworth Sleepiness Scale is really going to. A score of greater than 10 on the Epworth Sleepiness Scale is going to distinguish normal sleepers from people that are suffering from some sort of um, excessive sleepiness. So hypersomnia, OSA, obstructive sleep apnea, um, narcolepsy, potentially. Uh, it's not a particularly uh, specific instrument, um, but certainly when you put the ISI and insomnia together with the ESS, um, what you tend to see is classic insomniac will have very low ESS score because they're not very sleepy. They're tired, 
but we also say that they're wired so they can't fall asleep. So tired but wired. Um, so they'll have a high ISI score, but a very low sleepiness score. To really get a good uh, steering on OSA then is the stop bang. Um, and that's eight questions. Um, stop bang has its name because that's an acronym. So S for snoring, T for daytime tiredness, O for uh, observed obstructions to breathing at night, um, P for blood pressure, um, high blood pressure, B for body mass in, uh, index over 25, A for age, so 50 and older, N for um, neck circumference greater than 42 centimetres, and then gender being male. So that's quite a, um, a very nice instrument, um, quick, and a score of greater than three um, is 93% sensitive for moderate OSA and 100% sensitive for severe OSA. Um, and the last thing I'd suggest is also the sleep hygiene index. So part of that assessment was picking up what's happening during the day um, for people and night. And so the sleep hygiene index is a nice validated um, questionnaire that will let us know if there's some stuff going on with sleep hygiene that is affecting the person's sleep. So they've, um, and it tends to break down into, um, so factor analysis says sleep disturbing behavior and environment, or it'll pick up a regular sleep wake schedule. So quite useful questionnaires. There's about 50 questionnaires and take about 15 minutes to complete all that stuff. Um, and then you get a pretty, um, you can see what's going on. And then treatment, if insomnia is present, is going to be um, the recommended treatment is CBTI or cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia. Uh, it's a multi-component therapy. Um, it's about four sessions over eight weeks. So given that insomnia is a chronic condition, that's pretty quick. Um, you know, when you consider um, depression will take sort of 16 plus sessions potentially. Um, it involves a couple of things. Uh, it's got sleep restriction, as we call it. I prefer to call it um, sleep efficiency training. Um, I'll explain that in a moment. Um, it's got another uh, behavioral um, treatment called stimulus control thrown in there. Relaxation training. Um, and actually, I'll just go back one. Those three are all recommended um, standalone treatments for insomnia, but you get more effect when you put them all together in a multi-component therapy. So worry management, starting to get into some sort of generalized anxiety disorder type management strategies, um, cognitive restructuring, really standard um, components of CBT in general. Um, and you've got sleep hygiene in there, but note that sleep hygiene is necessary, but not sufficient for treating insomnia. So sleep hygiene is usually going to be the control, active control condition when you, when you do um, research on CBTI. Um, and then uh, if the clinician's skilled enough, there's other cognitive therapy techniques as required for other disorders or non-adherence. And, uh, and so things like ACT and mindfulness um, are also being increasingly thrown into the mix. Um, you'd want your clinician to also be able to treat um, PTSD if it's there, which is other, there are other evidence-based therapies for that, but around about 90% of people with PTSD will have some sort of sleep disorder. Uh, so let's go back to our patients and look at how we diagnose using those instruments and um, what the differential diagnosis looks like um, using the instruments, the sleep log, and then what treatment might look like as well using CBTI. So here's Joe again. Um, what's going on for him? I pointed out what OSA was. And so these morning headaches, if you're not getting enough oxygen, morning headaches, not uncommon, can be a, uh, one of the symptoms of OSA. Reflux, that's not uncommon with people with sleep problems, but also OSA as well. So is that what's going on? So assessment instruments. So um, I've chucked in the depression, anxiety, stress screen, mainly because I want you to see what happens with his depression or these clients' depression scores, even when they're asleep problem is treated, despite the fact typically I haven't touched their depression. So insomnia severities, uh, at the clinical level, it's moderate severity. So 17 out of a possible, I think it's like 29 or something. Um, he, it was sleepiness scale, says he's got average daytime sleepiness. So there's a little bit, I'll just go back one. There's a little bit weird because um, he's got insomnia, but he's also got sleepiness. And I mentioned that classic insomnia, you won't have a score that's tipping up towards the 10, which I mentioned was the cutoff uh, for 
uh, some sort of hypersomnolence issue. So now I'm starting to wonder what's going on here with this person. Um, and then the stop being, you can see there, he's at high risk um, because he's got a two and a two. So the stop can be analyzed separately from the bang criteria. Um, there's a marking, really simple marking criteria that go with it. So that's why it's split in two, but he's a high risk for OSA. So, um, so is it OSA that's going on for this guy? Is this why he's waking up and having trouble falling asleep? Well, can't really say um, certainly can send them to the GP because I don't treat OSA, so I can send them back to the GP to get an assessment for that. But um, what's going on up here? Um, let's have a look at a sleep log. So what a sleep log actually looks like. I'll just pull you down to number five here. After turning the lights out, how long does it take him to get to sleep? You can see hours, right? Hours to get to sleep. So this is this is more aligned with insomnia or chronic insomnia because usually OSA you'll see more sort of wake ups at night. Not always, but typically that's what I'd expect. Because in stage uh, two and three sleep, that's where the body relaxes and so there's um, the soft palate and that start to relax and fall back into the, in the tongue. So um, now here's where this, so this confirms the diagnosis of um, chronic insomnia probably sleep apnea once he gets a test for that. So we're going to have to treat that. And here's where the sleep diary gets really useful, right? Look at this. He's going to bed at 10 p.m. and it's taking him hours and hours to fall asleep. But look, when he goes to bed at 11, suddenly it gets shorter. When he goes to bed at 11, again, it gets shorter. So you can immediately start saying to this guy, well, look at that. Maybe if you went to bed a bit later, you might fall asleep quicker. And actually, that's what the, um, so I mentioned, I, I didn't actually cover off what sleep efficiency or sleep restriction is. Um, but say for someone like Joe, um, he's spending quite an excessive amount of time in bed, but he's not actually asleep for most of it. So I think, um, actually, I'll just flip back on the slide so you can see. Um, here, he's actually spending about eight hours, um, eight and a half hours time in bed um, on average a night, but he's only sleeping for about five hours of that. So if we divide the five hours that he's actually asleep into the time that he's spent in bed, you get a percentage score and we call that sleep efficiency. So he's about 60% sleep efficient. He's just not at, uh, a normal sleeper should be about 85% sleep efficient. So there's quite a big gap there. He's spending a lot of time awake. And that's what you see with insomniac. So, um, so they're spending an excessive amount of time in bed awake. And that's part of the problem. So the treatment is actually to increase their sleep efficiency by restricting the amount of time that they spend in bed, pushing back that bedtime, for example, so that he goes to bed maybe at about midnight. And then you see, okay, now he's getting about, uh, so he was spending, what did I say, about five hours in bed. Uh, so five hours of sleep. So you go five hours of sleep. That's what your body can create. We'll add on 30 minutes to give you some time to fall asleep. And, uh, and then we'll will count backwards from the time that you want to wake up to determine what time you should go to sleep. So that's sleep efficiency training. Um, stimulus control. So when you spend a long time in bed, um, what tends to happen is that your brain, uh, well, your brain has associations with different things and um, in the bed, is a, typically we have an association with sleeping. And so when you get into bed, that helps you fall asleep, that association. When you spend a long time in bed awake, uh, you start to get other associations with being anxious, being, um, being frustrated, and all these kinds of um, associations. So what we're trying to do is restore that association between bed and sleep by telling the client to, if you're awake, get out of bed, don't struggle, don't try to sleep, um, wait until sleepiness comes, get out of bed, go do something else, or at least sit up and read a book and don't focus on trying to sleep. So that is stimulus control. Um, you can tell when someone has stimulus control uh, issues or stimulus discontrol because I tell you things like I was really sleepy on the couch and then I went to go into the bedroom to fall asleep um, and suddenly I was wide awake so we call that like flicking the switch so like a light switch bam it's on and you're wide awake that would be an indication of stimulus discontrol so I want to treat that with uh, that prescription that I just mentioned some relaxation training in there for Joe Worry management, wake up routine. He was struggling to wake up at one, uh, get out of bed at one point because he's feeling tired, uh, sleepy, and fatigued later on in training. And then relapse prevention. So I've highlighted and read the bits that are not as common, but uh, what relapse prevention should be part of any um, 
intervention uh, so that the patient uh, can learn and not come back to you for treatment if they relapse. Um, so, but I've just highlighted the, uh, the difference between what is pretty standard CBTI and a little bit of additions. So this is what the treatment effect looks like. So this is Joe's um, numbers. You can see here in blue, this is the time that he's, uh, his time to fall asleep. So it's over two hours, 154 minutes to fall asleep. Um, and then he's spending about 50 minutes awake at night as well. And then across, uh, it looks like uh, it does take a little while, nine weeks, but uh, there's not actually nine treatments per se. But look at that, he's down to 15 minutes by the end of it. He's 15 minutes to fall asleep. And, um, but quite a big difference just between session one and two, and that's quite common. Uh, and so there's actually four half sessions just titrating his sleep um, log or sleep um, prescription. And you can see his depression dropped um, into the normal range. His insomnia disappeared. Um, he came off antidepressants. Um, his, his partner let him back into the bed. Part of the reason why he was depressed was because his partner didn't want him in the bed because he was rolling around awake for so many hours. Um, did he have OSA? Don't know. Uh, don't know if he ever got onto that, but certainly he got rid of, we got rid of the insomnia. So what's going on for Hennymore? Um, so as we noted, she's pretty complex. There's a lot going on. Assessment instruments, pretty severe depression, anxiety, stress. Um, the ISI is right up there as well, clinically um, significant and severe. No abnormal sleepiness on the ESS. So that's that classic um, tired but wired insomniac and stop being slow. So we can pretty much say, uh, we can be pretty confident that that's insomnia, but having a look at the sleep log also tells us the same. What does the sleep log add to the equation here? We can see here that she's, uh, she's spending quite a lot of time, um, lots of difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep even more. Um, but we can also see there's lots of variation in the time that she goes to bed and the time that she falls asleep, 8.30 through 11 and also the time that she gets out of bed, 7 a.m. through to 11 a.m. So that's that long time in bed um, that we see with a lot of insomniacs. And actually, she's spending about 12 hours in bed and an average of just under six hours of sleep. So, um, so uh, here's where the sleep log can also be really helpful. As you can see, here's the medication she's taking and here's their effect on her time to fall asleep. So not really having much effect at all there. Um, and so that's helpful for clients when they see that. It confirms um, that actually this might not be doing that much for you. And then it helps them start tapering. And as they taper, they can see the impact of um, tapering off their medication. Look, it's not doing anything for their sleep. So treatment. So you obviously need to deal with the suicidality. Um, and I'll just make a note here. So you know, I didn't do sleep restriction here. Anxiety clients, high anxiety, often they're too anxious not to spend time in bed. So you have to negotiate with them. Um, and here, instead, I just compressed her sleep by encouraging her to get up at the same time every day. And she spent about eight or nine hours in bed instead of 12 um, overall, but she was still going to bed at roughly the same time. It would have been too triggering for her to go to bed uh, or to stay up um, until later. And, uh, so a couple of extra things in there for her presentation, but the rest is roughly pure um, CBTI. And you can see here, again, pretty big change. She's spending like five hours awake at night and about an hour and a half to fall asleep. And then within four sessions, um, she's actually down to normal sleep. So she has chronic, uh, sorry, short-term insomnia. Um, and so there's probably a bit of that in the mix in terms of really high, um, uh, emotionality in there but you can see here that's her time in bed so close to 12 hours here's the um, total sleep time just under six and then by the end of treatment she's sitting on about eight and a half and seven and a half hours of sleep now that was two sessions actually um, but I had four sleep logs from here across that time her depression you look at that dropped off anxiety didn't really do that much to treat the depression again um, and no insomnia there, um, panic attacks are reduced, that's what you're seeing here with the anxiety dropping off, um, and she's back at work with a shift, work strategies are working well for her. So um, pretty good result. And then the last, the last guy here, Craig, what's going on for him? He's using all those medications, there's not much going on though. Um, he's still, and he's waking with these panic attacks. 
So assessment instruments, if you, uh, again, the DAS, just giving you those scores there is extremely severe on his depression, anxieties up there uh, and stress. So he's severe on the ISI, so he's um, potentially chronic insomnia, it's been going on for a while. Um, the ESE is no day daytime sleepiness. So again, um, that's that classic um, tired but wired. But there's a stop being showing that he's got, uh, he should be assessed for um, OSA. And that's probably what's causing those panic attacks in the middle of the night or the panic symptoms in the middle of the night that he's experiencing. But his sleep, um, his sleep assessment, so those are instruments like the Auckland sh uh, short, the Auckland sleep questionnaire, pick up that he's ticked the box for he feels better if he falls he feels like he falls asleep later than most people and, and he feels better when he wakes later than most people so that's an indicator of delayed sleep phase disorder uh, or delayed sleep wake phase disorder now obviously I've got the luxury of a few more assessments in my toolbox and time to do those um, interesting I have a chronotype questionnaire it's five questions long um, he came out as a definite evening type so that's his circadian rhythm type um, and he also mentioned that he doesn't eat any breakfast, um, which is very common for people, probably because they're getting up at like 10 a.m. in the morning, but often they just don't feel hungry as well. Um, so no breakfast in there. And then he's having dinner quite late, 9 p.m. So, I mean, it's going to take you a while to fall asleep if you have a big meal at 9 p.m. So that's another indicator of that delayed sleep phase. Uh, but you need something to confirm that, confirm your suspicion. And look here on the sleep log, uh, you've got... So he's spending about two hours at 12 a.m. It's taken him two hours to fall asleep. So he's falling asleep at 2 a.m. When he goes to bed at 2 a.m., it's taken him 20 minutes to fall asleep. It's a bit of variation here. There's another 2, 2.30 uh, a.m. Um, fall asleep time. Um, so a bit of variation. But on average, he's uh, lights out at 12.30 if you average these out. And his latency to fall asleep is 60 minutes. So he'll do well to be going to bed at about 2 a.m. Oh, sorry, 1.30 or so. Um, so uh, a couple of other things that are really interesting here. He, uh, when he sleeps longer, he feels better. And actually this 2 a.m. to 9 9.30 a.m. out of bed is quite a common sort of sleep time for delayed sleep phase disorder. And he's, um, and this was actually a night where he got 88% sleep efficiency, no, no wake ups, quick fall asleep. Um, same thing here, he feels a bit better when he gets up at 10 a.m. It's not as, not as ideal, um, but that helps to confirm that he's got uh, delayed sleep phase disorder. So that's a completely different treatment. If I used um, cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia with him, uh, we wouldn't get that far. So we need to have a different treatment. There's bright light in the morning and specifically timed melatonin used as a chronobiotic, not as a hypnotic um, for him to drag his sleep uh, his sleepiness forward so that it was circadian rhythm forward so he can fall asleep earlier. We still need stimulus control so he knows what to do when he's waking up at night. Uh, he, he needed a few other things um, for him because fit fatigue management because he's getting so little sleep because he's falling asleep late and having to get up for work at like 6 a.m. So it took about five sessions with him and we didn't actually complete um, but I kept him in here. Um, we didn't complete because he had a big um, gastro problem and so we had to stop treating. We actually never touched his depression. Um, he was supposed to be working with someone else on it but I don't know if he was doing that much. Um, but you see here he actually dropped 10 points um, on his depression score and that's just by getting him to sub-threshold and, and, and again I'm using the ISI. He hasn't got insomnia but it's showing the drop off of the sleep problem from being quite severe to being a little more benign for him. And so his sleep log, um, sorry, his sleep results look a little different. Whoops. Um, he's got, and it, and it trails off a little bit slower because it takes the body a bit of time to um, get used to the treatment and start to creep forward in terms of his ability to fall asleep or his sleep time creeps forward. Um, now, but you can see here that he started with relatively short sleep time compared to the our time in bed compared to the others and, uh, and not getting a lot of sleep time. And then over here, by the end, he's getting a lot more um, time in bed and that is actually spent sleeping. And if you look at his sleep log, he's actually falling asleep at around 11 uh, with treatment um, instead of 2 a.m. 
Uh, so that's the kind of treatment results you can expect and why you need to get the right uh, with CBTI, but also why you need to get the right kind of diagnosis going on, otherwise you just won't get results. So when you do make the diagnosis, what are you going to do when you spot uh, chronic insomnia or chronic insomnia with OSA as well? Um, so these are the recommendations from the AASM for um, treating chronic insomnia. So um, you can see here, strong recommendation for multi-component cognitive behavioral therapy. So that's the Better Sleep Clinic, what we do. You also have um, conditional recommendation for multi-component brief therapies. So this is more like this um, Sleep Well Clinic. Um, I think Tony Fernando probably fits the bill of a brief therapy. Um, and then as I mentioned, you could use just single component therapies if probably if it was a standalone insomnia um, disorder. And then down here, we suggest you don't use sleep hygiene as a single component therapy because it's not going to work. Um, and your, um, your patients will get pissed off with you too because they probably, their sleep hygiene is probably um, cleaner than anything you've ever seen before. Um, so uh, once you tell them that, they just think, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, so not always, but um, but I would still just let them know, hey, look, you need to have this stuff in place. So go over it, um, give them some sleep hygiene. I'll talk about what you can do. Um, but I think that's important to note. Um, now, um, so what can you do in the, uh, in the primary care setting? So I think uh, what you really need to focus on is, is really good diagnosis, right? Because then that's going to speak about what you're going to do from there. Now, if you're not going to treat, then I think you need to set up the referral well. Um, and that's telling the client, look, I'm referring you to, say, a sleep psychologist. And this isn't because it's, all in, it's not all in your head, right? Um, they're not going to put you on a couch and talk to you about your childhood. Um, this is... Um, treatment that is practical and it's going to target imbalances in the sleep-wake system and, um, and neurobiological factors that are keeping you awake at night. Um, if you do want to treat, um, then I would, this is, I, I had a big think about this and I thought about all the things I could say and I thought, well, what would I tell a bunch of clinical psychologists or psychology um, colleagues? And I would say get training, right, because that's the ethical thing and a professional thing to do. So I'm not just throwing things at people when I don't really understand them that well. Um, and actually that is the recommendation as well in the uh, primary care sleep disorders textbook. Um, that I have, which was released a couple of years back. And they just said, look, because you've got so many um, comorbid and occult sleep issues, um, you need to be able to adapt behavioral regimes based on you know, your understanding of the principles and theories and to get optimal outcomes. And also you need to have be able to deal with non-adherence and, um, and typically they're recommending sort of one hour session and you're probably not gonna have that. So. Um, really have to think hard about what you want to do in that environment. But what you can do, again, going back to that sleep hygiene, so it's not a single component therapy, but it is important. Um, it will cover some, a bunch of people that you'll see in primary care. And then the second thing is um, letting people know, look, double check on this stuff. It's not going to be sufficient if you've got chronic insomnia, but it is necessary. So have a look over this stuff. And then here's four really simple recommendations you can give to people. So... I'll highlight the first three, adopt a consistent rise time. Um, that's probably the most important thing in all of sleep medicine treatments, consistent rise time. A new study just came out saying that most people could benefit if they keep the sleep, same amount of sleep that they get, but just get up earlier. So shift your entire sleep schedule, 30% um, improvement in moods. But that consistent rise time um, is really important. So anchoring that and telling them to you know, anchor their sleep time if necessary, or at least compress it a little bit if they're spending too much time in bed. Second thing is don't chase sleep, right? If they have a bad night, it's fine. Um, they'll recover from that bad night in three to five days. They'll catch up, they'll feel better for it, it'll be over. Um, if you need to recover sleep, then balance the books, right? So if you, if you need a 30 minute catch up nap during the day, then delay your sleep time or time to bed by 30 minutes. So keep things really regular. And if you notice, those are actually, those first three are actually sleep restriction, time in bed type restriction, um, covertly um, instructions. 
<clears throat> and so they're going to get a little bit of sleep deprivation if they do that, but that's going to benefit them by deeper sleep the next, uh, a night later. And then the last one is never spend a long time awake in bed. So spend no more than 15 to 20 minutes awake in bed. And that last one there you see is actually stimulus control. So there you've given them, you've covered off the sleep hygiene aspects and you've also picked up on uh, some sleep restriction in a, in a covert form and a bit of uh, stimulus control. And then remind them it could take four to eight weeks for, if you really do this religiously for things to improve. If you've got to go for pharm pharmacotherapy, here's the, um, the AASM recommendations. And really that's the, not all of these are available in New Zealand, obviously, um, but you know, melatonin is not suggested. Um, and, uh, and this is actually a weak recommendation on uh, pharmacotherapy for, uh, from the AASM. So their, their suggestion is um, CBTI um, and short-term pharmacotherapy um, if you can't find a psychologist, um, which as Bruce pointed out, is probably going to be pretty um, common given that there's not many of me. But um, look, uh, there's a couple of other things that I will chuck up um, which are related to the impact of your antidepressants on PSG or polysomnograph. Um, so this is really important when you're looking at things like your SSRIs and the fact that a lot of them actually impact sleep negatively um, for at least about 30% of clients, I think it is, or patients, um, whereas you've got some other options. And um, Bruce is probably better to talk about this than me, but um, some like amitriptyline that do cause somnolence, which uh, people with insomnia will love you for, potentially. Um, and you've got a few other options there around, say, metazapine also increases somnolence. Um, and it just gives you an, a nice sort of understanding of what you might be getting into and what you might be seeing if people don't react well to um, medications and why um, in the sleep realm. And so there's a few different referral sources as well. Um, yeah, so 50 minutes, a little bit over time. Well, well done, Dan. That's great. Now, we've got a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> Now, I guess there's a question here. I have a lot of patients that really benefit from CBTI. Does the presenter know if there's anyone who would offer this in Christchurch? Thank you. I mean, I guess the question for you would be, can you do online consultations? Yeah, definitely online consultations. Um, if you want a more brief, and, and you know, because it will be a conflict of interest just to tell you to refer everyone to me. Um, Sleep Well Clinic is, uh, does have... Um, Christchurch office if they want in person. Not everyone wants online, but um, the evidence is online is no different. Um, so really then you're just deciding, is this person better off and able to fund the, um, the longer sort of session lengths as opposed to will they get something out of a brief treatment? A question here on cost of your service, um, Dan. Are we allowed to talk about cost here? Yeah, absolutely. Unfortunately, it's... Um, it's not cheap. It's, as I say to people, it's um, more expensive than a, than a plumber, but cheaper than accountant and lawyer. Um, so it's similar to other uh, clinical psychology services. Um, so we're talking a 90 minute assessment is 287.50, including GST, and a um, treatment session is um, $201.25 um, for a 45 to 60 minute sort of session. And um, I do actually give quite a lot of support um, outside of treatment as well. And, um, and, in the inter and because it's often spaced across weeks, then I'll be doing stuff on their sleep log, giving them feedback without actually um, necessarily charging. So all that stuff is included. Um, uh, how honest do you think patients are with their sleep logs? Do they over or underestimate? It doesn't actually matter so much because what you're looking at is if they overestimate, then they'll systematically overestimate everything. And if they underestimate, it'll be systematically underestimated. And so it's more the variance that matters. Um, as long as they're consistently uh, overestimating, underestimating, then, then it's pretty fine. You will get people that are like, I was asleep, I was awake all night and there's nothing on the, um, the, on the sleep log. Um, however, once they start with something like stimulus control, because they're not supposed to be lying in bed, um, then they get a, a much better understanding of whether or not they were awake or not. 
um, question here. Uh, the, the question is, are all well and good, but the nature of consultations would normally preclude these. Patients mm. are not likely to come in just for a somnia assessment. Insomnia tends to be a matter, uh, one matter of a list. And I know we, um, as you may know from our data, Dan, 42% of patients in primary care have a sleep problem, but very few of them mention it to doctors. And I think they think, one, you can't do anything about it. Two, they're worried you're going to give medication. Um, there's a whole lot of reasons why they don't do it. But I guess, I mean, uh, my view on this is you need to get people back in primary care if you can't do it. You know, I think the key thing in general practice is I say to people, we can't do this in one visit, you have to come back, maybe a longer visit. But in terms of the questionnaires, what would you, because you mentioned a number of questionnaires, which we will put online, but if you had to pick one or two or three of them, what would be, what would be the key ones for you? Uh, you need something like the Auckland, um, uh, the short tool, Auckland Sleep short tool. You need something like that, right? Um, and uh, I mean, the, the the first three, the ISI, the ESS and the stop bang, um, it, take, it takes people about 15 minutes to complete. I actually take, yeah, about probably less than 15 minutes to complete that. Um, so, I don't know. Um, the other thing, you know, in primary care is just, uh, and it's kind of on the, the Auckland um, sleep questionnaire is just kind of even, you know, sometimes in psychology, we just have a scaling question, right? It's just a line with one on, you know, and 10 on the other side and, you know, or really poor on one side and really great on the other. And you say, where is your sleep at the moment? You know, and yep. that, will, that will tell you straight away if there's something going on. Um, and if the clients aren't thinking it's going to be important, um, I mean, they aren't necessarily going to know what's that important. So sometimes it's our responsibility to flag it if we think it's important and then let them know why it's important. But I think we're sitting in an area where um, that is becoming more important. You know, people are, because the research is coming up and you're seeing more online about it and that sort of stuff. So, um, and that's why I sit in this area partly, you know, looking towards the future. Yep. And you're okay to put some of those questionnaires online afterwards, yes, Dan? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, so a question from Ben here. Hi, Dan and Bruce. Question for later. Have you found tracking apps, e.g. Fitbit, useful for diagnosis for insomnia? It records sleep duration and arbitrary sleep score and claims to be able to differentiate between REM, deep and light sleep and micro arousal. So I um, don't know if you've got experience with Fitbits. Um, it depends on what Fitbit you're using. Um, some of the more recent ones have uh, been studied and so you can find the research online. I forget exactly what, but generally speaking, what they all have trouble with is uh, being able to tell whether or not you're awake or asleep. So if you lie there really still, they'll probably think you're asleep even though you're awake, which of course is a bit of a problem with insomnia because there's a whole lot of people who are lying there really, really still trying and hope in vain that they'll fall asleep. So the um, it's going to start estimating, overestimating things. However, if the person is one of these people who are like, I was awake all night, sometimes I just get a really uh, simple sleep tracking app um, to give them a little bit of feedback uh, like sleep uh, what is it, iOS, um, sleep time, um, I think it's called um, sleep cycle, and that'll just pick up um, noise and whether or not they're asleep and awake, and um, so that can be helpful. There are some apps that are starting to pick up on stuff like OSA or devices. I believe the, the Wii things um, not the current one in Noel Lehman, but the one they sell overseas, which is uh, in Europe, which is called the Sleep Analyzer, that actually is validated in the research for picking up OSA. Um, so I'm kind of waiting to get my hands on one of those. Um, okay, so we've got some more questions. Um, uh, quite a nice one on delayed sleep phase. Um, uh, advanced and delayed sleep phase is normally a problem physically or mentally if the subject is not complaining of their sleep pattern. And in some ways, it's a societal problem, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. 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 I sometimes yeah. say to my teenagers with delayed sleep phase, because in a sense, it's a teenage pattern. Tony and I have found that 25% of university students have delayed sleep phase. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, that their, their bodies in, um, in Adelaide and their brains in Auckland, um, you know, that sort of, so if they, if they could get their brain and body in Adelaide, they would have no, normal sleep problems, you know, just that they're, um, but um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, right? It's a subjective complaint. So yeah. if, you're, if you're 75 years old and you're waking at 4 a.m. and you fall asleep at sort of 8, 8 p.m., um, but it's not a big, um, you know, your lifestyle can accommodate that, then it's not a, it's not a disorder. And unfortunately, sleep, sleep medication often helps people in those situations, but it's, it's treating, you know, a normal biological problem, isn't it? Mm. They will... Yeah, they yeah. will maybe get an extra couple of hours sleep, but actually that's, uh, if they can, if they're happy to get up at three o'clock in the morning and they're functioning okay, so be it. Yeah, I mean, and you think about insomnia as a subject of complaint as well, right? So yeah. um, so if you got three hours of sleep every night, but it didn't bother you, you're fine. I actually worked with, um, I was posted to the SAS for a while and was, you know, they're, they're people that love short sleep. If they could all be, if all, if all of them had insomnia, they'd love it. I think it was so productive. Um, and one guy came up to me and said, look, I, I only get three hours of sleep. I'm, a, I'm objective. I'm just a short sleeper. doesn't have any impact on me. Um, that's me. And there will be people like that, right? Because when you see those, um, you know, how much sleep should I be getting? Sleep quantity, everyone's focused on sleep quantity, but sleep quality is really the issue. And those sleep quantity um, bands are quite wide, right? So it's sort of six or so hours through to nine for an adult or something like that. So um, so you could be getting six hours. It's not a big deal. A comment on a utility of risk sleep trackers, the Garmin Apple Watches. Uh, for, so the quality? Um, for, uh, I guess, any sleep problem, uh, normal, abnormal. Yeah, same as the Fitbit, right? That, that's the, yeah. the same uh, answer applies. Um, they're really good for making people turn up with worries about not getting enough deep sleep. And that's where you need to educate them on things like, look, only 25% of your night is going to be in deep sleep. You're not going to spend like 90% of your night in deep sleep. So don't worry about the fact that your watch says this and it's probably inaccurate anyway. GP here wanting to do CBTI sleep training. Uh, can you get training in that, um, Dan? Do I give training or where do you get oh, training? Yeah. Well, you know, is, is there an option for GPs to learn some of this sort of stuff? Would you be willing to run courses? Uh, yeah, could probably, uh, definitely could look at it. Uh, maybe talk with the messy sleep wake. I was, I was thinking about this. There's no one training in New Zealand for this stuff. So, um, so yeah, maybe it's an option, uh, but, but down the line, yeah. Um, so there's a yes to that one. Um, uh, Sleepwell has Alec Mortlock in Christchurch. That's right. Yeah. Um, he's a psychologist. He's a clinical psychologist. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, what about what do you do about patients who get to sleep easily but wake up consistently about four to five hours later and don't get back to sleep? What What do you do for them? Yeah. <laughs> Give a real good diagnosis and assessment to find out what's going on. Um, let me just think for one moment. Um, so uh, it's, it's probably a little bit, takes a little bit of time to maybe answer that question. So I'm not sure I could give a, a great answer, but um, but basically what we, so if you fall, uh, so yeah, I guess it, it could be one of many things, right? So diagnosis is Important. Is there any free online CBT option? I think there are some apps, aren't there? I work with youth who often have little money to spare. Yeah, um, so I can't remember uh, which big name in, in um, CBT. Uh, oh, actually, no, that's a paid option. Um, um, what are the apps that are free? So the US Veterans of Fears, what's the app called? CBTI, oh, I'll, I'll send it to, I, the only thing I've heard about that free app though is, so it has things like the sleep log and stuff in it. Um, the problem, oh, CBTI Coach is from the America, uh, the US Veterans of Fears. Um, and, but the only thing I've, people, I haven't really looked at it. Um, I think people say it's a bit clunky. Um, but hey, it's better than nothing. Uh, Jonathan asks, useful talk, can we get access to the video 
for reference later. Yeah, this is all recorded. You can go back and watch it, no problem. Um, uh, does exercise, timed exercise help at all? Also, is there a minimum number of hours of sleep needed to prevent those health problems? Minimum number, uh, does exercise help? Let's answer that one first. Uh, yes, so usually the studies are looking at exercise in sort of the late afternoon, and that seems to um, improve sleep um, or time to fall asleep and, uh, and depth of sleep, I believe. Um, so sleep continuity. And, um, yeah, but you don't want to do exercise too close to bed. Um, time so get it, vigorous exercise within sort of an hour or so of bed is obviously going to push back your sleep time. Um, the other thing that you might be saying to clients is when you uh, anchor your sleep time and uh, get up and go for some exercise, um, go for a walk and get 30 minutes of sunlight, right? Because that sunlight is going to help the body clock and also the exercise timing in the morning um, is also going to be a signal to the circadian clock. Mm. Paul has found the Veterans Association app and it's in your chat box, folks. Have a look there. Um, do you have any advice for assessment tools for children? Uh, for children. Um, so I haven't sort of branched into this area yet. Um, so mm -hmm. what are we talking about? The Albany Sleep Questionnaire. Um, I forget the other one. And um, the... the is one um, and also you really need some stuff to assess the parents and their readiness to actually commit to doing the behavioral intervention for the kids um, so it's a little bit complex and if you hated the length of the ones that i just showed on here and thought they were impractical then you'll absolutely hate the questionnaires for the kids as well because they are a lot longer there, there is uh, there was a service where where there was a woman who used to do telephone consults for infants with sleeping problems because one member of my family used it. Actually, it was pretty good advice, and they got the baby kids sleeping sleep consultant type people. What's that? Baby sleep consultant. Yeah, yeah. No, I just um, I don't know if they're still in business, but um, yep. it was all done by telephone. It cost about one hundred and fifty dollars, and uh, got the kids sleeping basically. But as you say, the parents have to be ready to bite the bullet. Parents who won't abide the bullet won't get their keeps kids sleeping. I, well, I think not for a long time. I don't know what you think of that, Dan. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, because it's a behavioural system, right? Um, yeah. The, the, the kid is, it's not working on one level for the parents, but it is working on another level yeah. for them. If you, if you give them a bottle of milk at three o'clock in the morning, they're going to want it for the rest of the week. You know, fatal mistake. Yeah. I mean, if they're, if they're not hungry, but if they're just waking up and that's your soothing. Better to take antidepressants in the AM, probably the SSRIs, yes, but metazapine and amitriptyline um, have a sedating, so they're better off in the evening. Depends. Um, we traditionally give all antidepressants at night, but I think that's probably not a good idea. And the slide you were showing would sort of attest to that, I think, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's, you know, and, and sometimes sleep, sleep efficiency or sleep, um, you know, bedtime restriction is quite difficult when the antidepressant maybe is, is actually suppressing their total sleep time. So they, you just can't extend their sleep time for them once they're sleeping well. And so they, they're stuck with like six hours or five and a half hours or something that is consolidated sleep, but it's not, it's not developing and partly because I think the, the SSRI is influencing that. Question about light boxes. You mentioned them with the delayed sleep phase because um, you can buy them online here for about three hundred dollars. I think, can't you? And yeah, you um, not so much a light box these days. Um, you're looking at things like um, sort of glasses. There's two companies that um, this is out of Australia, Retimer, um, and they and this is scientifically validated. Um, so it looks something like that, um, and you chuck that on. You turn it on, it gives you the right, it's got green light, not blue, um, shines on the right angle into the eyes. Um, and then you've also got, uh, there's a company in the in Europe that sells something like that. I can't quite remember um, who they are, um, but that's validated as well. So those are, those are a lot better, obviously, um, than having to sit in front of a big light box. Okay, so that's a good one. 
A question there about the melatonin and valerian. I know valerian, I think, has not been shown to be effective, and I don't know why they were down on melatonin. It does seem to work for some people. Um, I haven't, I've never really had a good hard look at the research on melatonin. Um, I think, you know, because you've got to separate that out from it might work, but is that a placebo? So, um, yeah. yeah. I think the, I've looked at the evidence on valerian and basically it's, um, it doesn't seem to work and, and it's got side effects. Um, uh, any medico legal obligations regarding driving, especially pilots? With sleep problems yeah of course um so i didn't really um say because i wasn't sort of giving you um how to do sleep restriction per se um but what you're going to find is people with insomnia you know they've got high fatigue and but they have got low sleepiness and then at some point i'm always telling them look when treatment's working you'll know because it actually gets worse before it gets better because now you're going to have high fatigue and you're going to have high sleepiness on top and that sucks and it really um, is difficult and so that's and so whenever you start someone who's um, working in a in a um, safety critical industry, you need to be um, sending something to their primary care physician. Well, send something to yourself um, to or um, or let them know about the safety and put some stuff in place around safety. So it might be naps during the day, timed naps and stuff like that to fight the sleepiness without um, screwing up their evening sleep. Got a question, I think, about your SAS man functioning on three hours sleep. Do you think they're really getting three hours sleep? She thinks six to eight hours was, was needed for storing memories, getting rid of waste, etc. Do you think the man was getting three hours sleep or? Who knows? He might have chronic insomnia and, and just not it's not an issue for him, right? Because it's, it's not subjectively a complaint, it's a benefit for his job. Um, or he may, there are simply people who are objectively short sleepers and it doesn't impact them, right? Um, so that is a, um, you know, because there is, it's on a bell curve, I believe, in terms of sleep need. Um, yeah, so he might just- Do you have right. a view on cannabis helping people to sleep? Um, <laughs> I've tried to find evidence on this and it seems to be all over the place, but do you have a view on that, Dan? Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not cannabis um, because the, the PSG, and, and this is not sort of meta-analysis type stuff, this is single studies, um, shows that um, it actually uh, tends to fragment sleep and, and creates poorer sleep. Um, so everyone will tell you that they sleep better with their cannabis, but actually over time it gets worse. Um, and I... And because I am seeing people coming through with um, CBD oil and stuff like that, sometimes it's prescribed by their GP and that sort of stuff. So I think we really need to think about, um, there are lots of things that can improve sleep, like alcohol will help you fall asleep really fast, right? Um, but it's not actually helpful in the long term. And, I, and if you don't have the long term data for something like um, CBD, then you might find that um, they end up with a different problem a year down the track. And so there are two studies that I've seen. I can try and push them um, somewhere to Bruce or something. Um, one was with cancer patients treating, so pain, cancer, and this was released, I think, last year. Um, and what they were seeing was that two years in, it wasn't doing anything for cancer pain. Um, and so, you know, you've got habituation, so they have to increase the dose. And then what was happening was actually that it was starting to impact their sleep negatively. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of a little bit uh, concerned about um, that. Obviously the jury's out until there's more long-term research, but um, that would be my suspicion. Um, Danielle has said this way up, an Australian website does insomnia CBT online, but you have to say you're an Australian citizen and it's free. <laughs> She's given the web link there. I don't know whether Paul can pop it into the chat box under Daniel H. Paul. Um, if you could put that up, that would be good. Um, what do you think of Sleepio app? It's free. Is it free? Much about that? I'm, I wasn't aware if it's free. So Sleepio was the one I was trying to think of. Um, I think it's like 400 bucks or so, is it? Um, maybe, it, but... 
I believe that that's the one that has become available in the UK for primary care um, because the NHS has signed um, up with Sleepio. And um, so if you tell, if you're from the UK or you can prove that you're a resident, then it is free. Yeah. So they're all fine, right? Um, they're not as effective as um, full treatment, but, uh, like the recommended treatment, but these are probably align with sort of brief treatments. Uh, magnesium helping sleep. Um, I've looked at this and there seems to be some evidence, but I don't know what your view is, Dan. Your evidence, you, the, yours is the only I've, I've ever seen. Oh, there's um, a couple of, couple of papers I've seen on that. Not a lot of evidence. Um, What's the essential sleep advice you give? Oh, and that magnesium one, though, I have seen with athletes, right, with people with aching muscles and stuff like that, um, it's got, it, it can help. But for your average sed sedentary person, I'm not sure it does much. Um, uh, Paul's just said in the chat box, Big Health is offering one year of free access to Sleepio for all NHS staff until 30 June 2021. So I don't know if you have to say you're an NHS staff worker or... Um, or what, but um, 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 Dan, we've had a lot of questions about shift work, and my understanding is that's a pretty complicated beast. Is that some, I, I don't expect you to answer it now, but uh, whether maybe we have another webinar, would that be something you think you could get across to primary care, or is it something you really probably have to refer to somebody? I know Tony sort of feels like it's too complicated, um for generalists to deal with um hmm yeah it's, it's kind of tailored to the individual in their sleep schedule uh sorry their shift work schedule as well so that that starts to include um sorry that starts to make it a bit more difficult um you you know the first line solution is stop shift work um, but that's not always pragmatic. And actually the sleep disorder doesn't necessarily go away, right? It's just assume that it will. Um, so um, yeah, it's, it's a tough one. And, uh, and a couple of bits and pieces there is you can work stiff work for quite a long time, but actually you get less tolerant as you get older. And, um, and so I have people turning up who are like, I've got the sleep problem. I don't know why I've been doing the shift work forever. You know, why is it happening to me now? It's actually because over time you become less tolerant, your body can't cope with it. Getting out of bed after midnight, after the age of 40 is very hard, I think. You know, I think as well, I say to doctors, you know, it's something you have to think about. Um, so what we might do, Dan, is perhaps get you for the symposium and you could do a workshop on shift work strategies uh, along with other things. Um, because I'm just thinking there's probably a small group of people who'd be interested in that um but um but we've run we've come to the end of time so i'd just like to thank you very much um had a lot of questions there and um if you can email us those questionnaires yours that would be great we'll put them up uh, online and i think that's been a great um a great session lots of interesting things there um and thank you very much and we will bid farewell to everybody Oh, hey, thank you. It's been great.